while living and working as a pastor in the state of New Jersey, it didn't take me long to find several close other pastors in the community. And I picked four of them and I specifically asked them, would you join me once a week as a prayer group, just the five of us pastors? And they agreed that we were all from different denominations. We had a variety of different schedules and things going on, but most of the time, once a week, all five of us were there to pray for each other and to pour our, out our heart to each other. One of them happened to be bivocational. He and his wife had their own Christian counseling business. They had an office somewhere where they would counsel people for a variety of things. They had both had degrees in Christian counseling, but mostly they counseled people in marriages and in family relationships. It wasn't long before God spoke to another church and called me away from New Jersey. I liked New Jersey, but God called me away from there and I went to a different church in Virginia. Shortly after moving to Virginia, I was missing my uh, group of pastors that I had met with for so many years and prayed with, but I heard through the grapevine that one of them, the guy who was bivocational, he had his own counseling business. He and his wife were having marital problems. And after that, he soon committed adultery, and then they got divorced. Eventually, I remember thinking that if a Christian couple that works in a professional counseling center teaching others about marriage, and the husband is also a pastor, if they can't work out their differences and stay married, then what hope is there for any of us? After getting remarried to someone else, he moved to a different location. He no longer was a pastor, but he still had a counseling service and opened up a new counseling center. I had seen other Christian couples struggle in their marriage in the inside the church or from other churches. I had seen Christian couples get divorced, but for some reason this one really discouraged me. I thought I knew him and his wife very well. We had spent time together with them. We ate each, at each other's houses. We did things together. I played tennis with him. I helped him celebrate the birth of their firstborn child. And yet, I could have never imagined the conflict that ensued in their marriage and eventually split them up. I was really disheartened by it. I tried several times after moving to Virginia to reach out to him, but he never returned my call. I actually got a hold of another Christian counselor who knew him real well. He had a new phone number, and I tried the new phone number, and he never took my call. So I don't know whatever happened to him after that period of time. But I tell you this story to emphasize to you that good family relationships are difficult. Marriage, perhaps one of the toughest jobs we ever have. Parenting, the second most toughest job we ever have. And grandparenting, well, that's a little easier, I guess, for some of you. But even professional Christian counselors also serving as pastors, they are tempted. And they have difficulty with family relationships. Now, with that story in mind, some of you might say, well, Michael, I, I grew up in a very normal Christian family. I had a good role model, and I've had a normal Christian family. Others of you might say, no, <laughs> I grew up in a dysfunctional family. You know, maybe that's your story. Perhaps even that phrase, dysfunctional family, has taken on several different meanings and actually lost its original meaning today. And some of us might say, I don't even know what a normal Christian family is anymore. It's hard to imagine. But I believe, and I'm going to point out to you today, that the Bible has some answers for all of us about family. I remind couples all the time, God created you. God 
created marriage, God created the family, and God created sex. Therefore, God and God alone makes the rules, has the expectations, and gives the instructions for family and marriage and sex. We as humans, we don't get to make up rules about the family. We don't get to make up rules about marriage. We don't get the opportunity to make up rules about sex and do whatever we want. God and God alone has that right. Why? Because He created all of it. The book of Proverbs, as we're going to look at today, is one place in the Bible where we find many wise instructions about family relationships. So if you will, please take out your sermon notes there that you see in the bulletin. We continue with our sermon series, Wisdom for Life, specifically looking at what the book of Proverbs has to say to us about wisdom. So in this series, we're looking at different topics such as relationships and family relationships. We're looking at ways to control our mouth, control our money, and even control our temper. Our memory verse has been Proverbs 2, 6. You've had several weeks to work on it now. I hope that you have memorized it. But let's say the verse together. We say it with me, please. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from His mouth come knowledge and understanding. Proverbs 2, 6. It's a great verse from Proverbs to remind you God has wisdom. He has understanding. He has knowledge for you each and every day. So we must go to Him and get it and look for it. So today we begin we, with this uh, topic, Proverbs for the Family, part four in this series. So we're asking God for His wisdom on how to get along with each other in the family and how to be husband and wife, how to be parents, and all that that teaches us from the book of Proverbs. I want to look at three very specific causes of tension within the family. These are not all of them. But there are three that Proverbs points out. And then I want us to look at three actions to improve family relationships. Again, all of these coming from the book of Proverbs. So looking on your sermon notes there for a moment, let's look at three causes of tension in the family. And you could name these as well as I could. But here's the first one. The first one is rebellious children. Proverbs 17.25 says, A foolish son brings grief. To his father and bitterness to the one who bore him. Now, every parent in here has dealt with disobedient children. You just cannot get away from disobedient children. Discipline of children is a full time parental responsibility. However, sometimes a child steps across the line of disobedience and becomes rebellious. Rebellious towards parents. Rebellious towards teachers, rebellious towards the authorities in the community, rebellious towards God, and it happens. So the tension and the conflict caused in the home by such a rebellious child is brought out here in this one passage of Proverbs by these words of grief and bitterness. It brings grief to the father and bitterness to the mother. This word grief is a very strong word in the Hebrew language. It can also mean anger and frustration as well as grief. And then the word bitterness in the Hebrew language here of Proverbs, it's only used one time in the whole Bible. <laughs> so both of these are very strong words. So if you as a parent have suffered with a rebellious child, you know firsthand the bitterness, the anger, the grief, the frustration that this verse is a talking about. And perhaps you're still experiencing that even right now. Because rebellious children are not limited to age. Sometimes children become rebellious as adults. And then not only do you have a rebellious child, you've got a rebellious husband or a rebellious mother or a rebellious wife an adult person leading in rebellion. The adult child may not be living with the parents anymore, but it still creates grief. It still creates bitterness in the family. So this is one cause of tension. Rebellious children, no matter what age they are. A second cause of tension in family relationships, look at number two with me, is sexual immorality. 
And I briefly touched on that in the story earlier, but this is from Proverbs 6, verse 32. It says, A man who commits adultery lacks judgment, and whoever does so destroys himself. So this one verse in Proverbs 6 speaks about a specific sexual immoral act, that of adultery. And it attributes it to the man. But we know that in the family there are many other acts of sexual immorality. There could be rape, there could be incest, there could be pornography. And it's not always the man. It could be the wife, it could be the husband, it could be the child or an adult child living in the home. Whoever it is, all of these actions demonstrate, as the verse says, a lack of judgment. It's a lack of wisdom. And by participating in sexual immorality, whatever the act may be, we bring destruction to self, we bring destruction and harm to the family. As I stated earlier, my pastor friend from New Jersey brought harm to his marriage through adultery. He brought harm to his parenting of his new son through adultery. And he brought harm to the church he was pastoring. Now look at a third cause of tension within the family relationship. The third one, contentious quarrels. Now you know this passage, Proverbs 21, 19. Perhaps some of you have memorized it through the years in your marriage, right? <laughs> Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife. Now, just as is in the case of sexual immorality, it's not always the husband committing sexual immorality. We also know it's not always the wife committing contentious quarrels, is it? A child, a grandchild, a husband, a wife, a brother, a sister, they can all be, as the verse says, quarrelsome and ill-tempered. It can happen to any of us. But the point here is this, that when these quarrels happen, when these ill tempers exist within the family, no one wants to be in that family anymore. They want to go to the desert, you know, where they can have some peace and quiet. One day I was talking with some people, some Christians who had just come back from Haiti on a mission trip. And they were surprised at the extremely poor economic conditions there. And they were talking about how difficult it was for families and how difficult it was for people to live in different regions of Haiti and how poor they were. I too have been to a third world country and I've seen some of that firsthand. I was in Uganda, Africa for a summer doing mission work and I've seen how the poor had lived. And it was an eye-opening experience. However, I don't think that we here in America are all that much better off than those in a third world country, even with our fast-paced lives, our great technology, and our strong economy. I don't think we're any better off. If we're better off, then why is there so much divorce in America? If we're better off, why is there so much domestic violence right here in Flowery Branch? I don't think we're any better off than those living in a third world country when it comes to family relationships. Perhaps <laughs> we should all go to the desert for a while as this verse lives and then we'll finally be done with our ill tempers and our quarrels. Now again, these three that I've listed here, rebellious children, sexual immorality, and contentious quarrels, these are not the only causes of tension in the family. And I'm sure you could think of others Perhaps money comes to mind. Well, in a few weeks on June the 30th, we're going to deal with the topic of money from the book of Proverbs. You may say somebody just got a bad mouth in the family. Well, we talked about mastering our mouth last week. What about anger? That's another cause of tension in the family. Next Sunday, we're going to deal with the topic of anger. So we'll get to some of those other topics. But as you look at these specific three today, rebellious children, sexual immorality, contentious quarrels, Perhaps you and your family have been through one or even more than one of these. So if we have experienced these in our family, does that mean that it is now hopeless for our family? Does it mean that our family is completely and absolutely destroyed? Does it mean there is no chance of survival. Does it mean that divorce is inevitable? I can say it. 
doesn't mean that we give up on each other as family. Well, I hope that you would say the answer to all of those is no. However, many of us treat it as the answer is yes. But we have to understand God wants to help families. And God has hope beyond the tension that is so prevalent that we can only see. You know, all we see is the present tension. It's hard to see past that what God sees, the hope and the help that he has for us. Sometimes the problem is that we ignore God's instructions and God's rules and God's expectations for the family and we start making up our own, as I referred to earlier. We can't make up those rules. We have to follow the ones that God already has. So God has a better plan. So let's take a look at some of his rules, some of his expectations from Proverbs that address these three causes of tension. So if you will, turn the paper over, look on the back of your notes there. Here are three actions then to improve family relationships based on those three causes we just looked at. First of all, follow the wisdom of your parents. Now, before we get too far in this, I'm not putting all of the responsibility on the child. Both parent and child have some responsibility here, but this can help us with that family tension where rebellious children are involved. So look at the proverb with me. This is Proverbs 6, verses 20, 21, and 22. The scripture says, My son, keep your father's commands and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart for how long? Forever. Keep that in mind. I'll come back to it in a minute. Forever. Fasten them around your neck. And when you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. I want to make it very clear, this proverb looks like all the responsibility belongs to the child. But you've got to read it closely. There's a responsibility for the parent, too. What's the parent's responsibility? The parent's responsibility is to teach the commands, the ways of God, the wisdom of God to the child, to the grandchild. In talking specifically about the commands of God, Moses reminded the Israelites in the book of Deuteronomy he said, take these commands and impress them on your children. Take these commands and talk about them when you sit at home and when you're walking alongside the road and when you lie down and when you get up. So we understand very clearly from the Bible that the responsibility to teach children and grandchildren about God, about Jesus, about the Bible, about how to pray, that responsibility belongs to the parent. It belongs to the grandparent. It does not belong to the public school system. Nowhere in the Bible does God give the responsibility of teaching about him to a public school system. The responsibility also needs to be borne by the church. In the Great Commission, Jesus tells us, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So as a church, we have a responsibility to discipleship all ages. But here I point out to you that the primary responsibility of teaching children about God, it belongs to the parent. And this verse in Proverbs is one part that teaches that. Now, the child has a responsibility. What is the child's responsibility? This proverb reminds us that the child's responsibility is to keep this wisdom. Don't forsake it. Keep the commands. Keep the teaching. Don't forsake it. Bind it upon you and obey it for how long? Forever. Even after mom and dad are gone, they're dead. Even after my grandparents are gone and dead, I'm still to keep this wisdom of God every day. Interestingly, I look this up. In the book of Proverbs alone, the word son or the word child appears 45 times. 45 times in the book of Proverbs, you find this word son or child. What does that mean? It means that there's this constant teaching from parent to child, father to son, mother to daughter, constant teaching throughout the book of Proverbs. It never ends. It just keeps on going. And what's the benefit? If the child chooses to keep this teaching, the benefit, it says, is when you walk, the teaching will guide you. When you sleep, the wisdom will watch over you. When you awake, the commands are going to speak to you. 
So I've summarized this by saying we are to follow the wisdom of our parents. And the key word is wisdom. Why? Because not all parents are perfect. <laughs> all parents, all grandparents make mistakes. I've made at least one mistake in parenting in my life, I know. <laughs> Sometimes parents are just wrong, and they do make many mistakes. However, I want to point out to you and emphasize to you that in this passage here in Proverbs, parents have the responsibility to teach their children about God, and children have the responsibility to follow that wisdom. So if your children and your grandchildren are following your wisdom, if they're following your teaching, then praise God for that. However, if your child or grandchild or whoever it may be in your family is not doing that, if they have become, as we said a minute ago, rebellious, not just disobedient, but actually rebellious to you, rebellious to God, rebellious to the society, if your child or grandchild has rejected your wisdom and rejected your teaching, they are accountable to God for that. Now, I know, that, I know that statement doesn't sound hopeful, but that's what this verse is helping us to learn. The scripture gives the parent responsibility, it gives the child responsibility. And if the child rejects your teaching, your wisdom from the, from the word of God, then that's not a reflection upon you as a parent or a grandparent. Instead, God will hold that child accountable for what they do. One son asked his mother this question. Mom, at what age do I finally get to do whatever I want to do? And the wise mother said, son, I don't know. No one has ever reached that age. <laughs> When my children, all three of my children, when they graduated from high school, I got them a very expensive graduation present. I wrote them a letter. <laughs> and I framed it, and I put their graduation picture on the letter. But in that letter, I summarized to each of my children all that I had done as a father. I summarized my fatherhood. I summarized all the things my wife had done for them. And I talked about teaching them in the ways of God. And then the second part of the letter, I said, now as an adult, you're prepared for life. You're graduating from high school. I've prepared you for life. Now you are accountable to God. I'll always be your dad, but now you're accountable to God for everything you do. The child bears that responsibility. And just as we have no guarantees that parents will teach their children about God, we also have no guarantees that children are going to follow the ways of God. Remember, Proverbs, the whole book of Proverbs, they are wise teachings. They are not promises. They're Proverbs. They're not promises. So keep that in mind when you're reading through Proverbs. But we understand these Proverbs are reading, they are God's expectation for us. And we each have a choice of whether or not we want to obey it. So if we as parents do our part, as this verse says, and we teach the commands of God to our children, and if children do their part to follow that for the rest of their life, then the tension in the family will improve. But if the parents aren't doing their part, or if the children aren't doing their part, then of course, we're all held accountable by God. Both parents and children have this responsibility. And for those of you right now, I'm sure there are some, for those of you right now who are suffering with that grief and anger and frustration of a rebellious child, no matter how old they are, I sympathize with you. It is hard. It is distressing. It is, it makes you angry and bitter sometimes. But I give to you the hope. Trust God to hold your child accountable. For their rebellion trust God to do that that is his responsibility now look at a second action we can do to improve family relationships number two is rejoice in your spouse and this helps us with the idea of sexual immorality look with me at Proverbs 5 18 it says may your fountain be blessed 
and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now, the blessing here, my understanding, the blessing refers to having children. May your fountain be blessed. May you have many children. But then it gives us this advice to rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now, I've known a lot of people who've taken that proverb and they've twisted it around to mean something it does not mean. For example, some will say, oh, this means that when I'm older, <laughs> I no longer have to rejoice with that spouse anymore. I only have to do it when my spouse is young. Or some will twist it and say, oh, now that my spouse is older, I can get rid of that one and go get a young one again. Yeah. That's not what this verse means, correct? The idea here is that we are to be completely and wholly satisfied, wholly content and completely joyful with our spouse until death. We should never desire anyone else. We should never want anyone else other than our spouse. And rather than try to commit sexual immorality within the home, whatever it may be, we are to rejoice with our spouse, be romantic with our spouse. And if you're single, rejoice in your singleness. We do not have to give in to sexual immorality in any way. God calls us as Christians to a higher standard. We say, but wait a minute, Michael, what, what if I've already messed up? What if I have committed sexual immorality? What if I have not been rejoicing in the wife of my youth? Well, the simple answer is repent of that sin. It's not hopeless. It's, you're not helpless. Repent of it. Be done with it. Start over again. Maybe go to some Christian counseling with the whole family. Just don't go to my friend in New Jersey, okay? <laughs> I don't think he can help you. But repent. Start over. Go back and start rejoicing again with your spouse in their, whatever age they may be. And depend on God for the healing that is needed to remove that tension in the family. Now, I recognize, because I've seen it, and you have too, there are certain situations where a husband or a wife or a child or a grandchild needs to be removed by the authorities from the family because it is unsafe with that person present in the house. I recognize that. And those are the extreme cases. And you certainly want to do everything to protect yourself and protect the child from someone in the home that's creating such a bad situation regarding sexual immorality that you need to call the authorities. You need to get that person out of the house. But regarding this scripture, I encourage you to turn completely away from any and every sexual immoral act. It will help you to improve the tension in the family. And make sure you're rejoicing in your spouse. Now, one more action here. Number three. Let go of the quarrels. Sounds easy, doesn't it? This idea helps us with contentious arguing and quarrels. Proverbs 17, 14 says it this way. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So do what? Drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. You've heard this verse before. The Hebrew word for drop, it can mean to forsake, to abandon, to let go of. So rather than continue with petty quarrels, and arguments, what are we to do? We're to drop them. We're to abandon them. We're to forsake them. Why? Because if we don't, there's a flood of water waiting to happen that's going to destroy the family. Now, I recognize there are some very tough issues, difficult issues that families need to discuss. Husband and wife, parent and child, grandparent and grandchild. We need to take the time to do that. But we've got to do it without arguing. Sadly, the idea of talking to someone in a civil way has seemed to vanish from our society, whether it be in the family or outside the family. We have lost our ability for civil discourse, and that's sad. But we can work with God's help to learn to talk one-on-one -on -one with people in the family over issues that are important without quarreling, without arguing. Most of the time, our contentious quarrels in the family are not over tough issues, they're over petty issues. And we get our backs all up about it. 
The proverb says, drop the matter before a dispute breaks out, before the dam breaks and the water floods. Perhaps you've heard this modern day proverb before. If you try to wrestle a pig in the mud, you will get muddy and eventually you learn that the pig enjoys it. Now what does that mean with the family? Like the pig in the mud, you may have some people in your family who like to argue, who like to have contentious quarrels and fight. And if you have one of those in your family, or if you're that one in the family, then you've got to come up with a different strategy to talk to them. I've dealt with this in my own uh, extended family. Because if you don't come up with a different strategy of communicating with that family member, you know, it's going to be a knockdown, drag out fight. And you know that. You've seen it happen before. So you have to intentionally remain calm. You have to intentionally control your own temper and thoughts and the way you speak and how loud you speak. You have to control that. You have to make sure you don't exaggerate what you say. Even a simple exaggeration in talking to someone who likes to fight, it's going to end up in a fight because they're going to recognize it immediately. You're exaggerating, you know. You have to be careful. You must stay calm, refuse to blame, refuse to attack. Pick a different strategy. And if necessary, drop the matter before his dispute breaks out because that pig likes to argue. I put the Proverbs together there. You saw that, right? So these are three actions from the Proverbs that will hopefully help you with the tension in your family. One or two of them, I hope, has been helpful to you today. And I pray that you will follow God's rules, God's expectations, God's instructions for the family. So my invitation to you is this. Take initiative to improve your family relationships. Take initiative to improve your family relationships. And we've looked at some ways of doing that, specifically from Proverbs. I pray you'll go over some of these scriptures, maybe look at some cross-references. We've only touched on a few, but there are many other scriptures in Proverbs and outside of Proverbs that deal with these same topics. And next week we'll deal with anger, a good one. But work on that. God has given us great wisdom in His Word and He has great hope for you and your family. So take initiative to improve your family relationships with God as your hope. Let's bow in prayer about it. Father, thank you for these Proverbs that help us with our family relationships. And we confess our sin to you today of being immoral, and hateful and mean sometimes to our own family members. We confess to you our sin of ruining some of our family relationships. And we confess our need for your forgiveness and we confess our need for your help and your hope. So help us to obey your rules for the family. Help us to place hope in your expectations for our family. Help us to take initiative to improve our family relationships. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.